Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to Fishery. So, I'm Alex with The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium on the Aquatic Morning Show. Just as I do every week, I have an episode each day that the Aquatic Morning Show runs on top of all my other episodes and my members always get to see all of them at once first if they're interested in doing so for just a buck 99 a month. So, the first story we have this week is about an interesting new study that just came out about guppies. So this is a story where they fed guppies a specific type of food. And one thing that we've known for a long time is that it's far, far more uh, beneficial to the ecosystem and to the food supply chain in general to use insects as a source of protein. Uh, for pets and, and for ourselves too even. They're just a lot better at eating whether it's grass or algae or whatever it may be. They're a lot better at converting it to energy and then us being able to eat it or feed it to our pets or whatever. So they wanted to do a study to see if they could feed just one type of food, one, one meal worm, one bug, one whatever, to guppies especially as babies, when it was really critical that they have a pretty well-rounded uh, nutrient source, um, even if those are very trace nutrients. And so they came up with feeding them uh, super worms, which are actually a type of beetle larva. And the Latin name for those beetles is Zophobia, uh, Zophobus morio, and uh, they ground that beetle into like a powder, and then they fed that to Pocilio reticulatus, uh, or reticulata, the uh, guppy, and they also gave them uh, other things like mealworm, uh, dried flake food, and in one tank they gave them uh, known food from the wild, and they fed them that, and they saw how they grew. Then in another tank, and they gave them as much of it as they wanted, like uh, they had like a dispenser every few minutes and then the tank got cleaned very frequently. And in the other tank, they had a choice of four different foods that would be dispensed into the tank. And the, the fish could eat a little bit of this, a little bit of that, whatever. And it was mealworms ground up. It was crickets, and then it was flake food, and then also, oh, the other one was uh, granules uh, from uh, basically bug bites. Uh, in the study, it doesn't say fluval bug bites, but it's, uh, it's uh, black uh, soldier larva fly, black fly soldier larva, beetle, uh, whatever you call them, little cocoons, whatever. Uh, they were ground up, and... Um, pressed into granules. So that has to be fluval, I would assume, bug bites. They always have the uh, black soldier fly larva in their foods. So in any case, they gave them the choice of those four plus also the, uh, the, the, the super, uh, <laughs> the super, I can't get over the name of it, the super larva or the super worm, depending on who you are and what you call it. But it was, uh, Interesting because then they gave them just that worm in another tank. So they had these three different studies kind of going and the control was supposed to be the ones in the wild. And then the best nutrition possible statistically about all the things a guppy could need were going to be in that tank where they could choose and eat a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Well, it turned out that at the end of 45 days they all had the same growth rate and they all had no discernible different look uh, in in uh, coloration and, and how vivid they were coming along. So they carried it out to adulthood and the same held true. And so what it really proved was that this may be a viable source of food for for guppies, but not just for guppies. Guppies are kind of a model for a lot of different fish, and it may be that they're a viable food source for a lot of different fish, and uh, yeah, it's just kind of interesting because they're a super rich in protein 
uh, food source. They don't require a lot of maintenance. And then there's also another little piece to this study that I thought was super interesting. And of course, as always, uh, for anybody who's a member on my site, it's, it's linked here uh, in the, uh, community tab, the studies and all the info that you could want that I, uh, found on these stories. But the, um, it's interesting too, that they also liked the flavor. I mean, they, they chose to eat the, the super worm, uh, and it had the highest protein content. So that kind of makes sense evolutionarily. Now, uh, this was published in the annals of animal science, uh, just, uh, last month, and uh, it's uh, article uh, 22, page 371 to 384, and uh, another little tidbit that I came across about um, these beetles, which is really cool, it, when I was looking into, like, is it really sustainable, like, is raising these a good thing, uh, why not just use, like, leftover salmon parts, or tuna, or, you know, something that's being processed already, for human food and then they take the scraps and they turn into fish food or dog food and that's often what's in our pressed or dried um, foods. Uh, you know, Aquarium Co-op actually has a great fry food that is a uh, powdered fish meal which is like salmon. So super high in, in protein and other things. Now you do run into partially the issues of heavy metals being in a lot of these fish though. So that's one downside um, over the long term there could be some you know, bad effects of storing that up in a food source for a fish that lives a long time um, to have lead or mercury in, in their food. Now, in 2016, there was a study and a group of high school students at uh, Ateneo de Manila Universita uh, found that uh, they could also be used as a waste disposal vector, these, these larvae. And so they were found that they, to, to eat polystyrene expanding foam, so like stuff for caulking and uh, all sorts of nasty um, packaging needs, so basically styrofoam and then also house caulking foam, they found that they would actually eat that and, and get nutrients probably from the carbon, but when they broke it down, it was reorganized molecularly. So it wasn't just little micro particles of that, that same plastic byproduct, which is really big news because, you know, the storyline has been that plastic is forever, you know, or, or last 60,000 or a hundred thousand or however long. And now we're learning that certain bacteria, certain fungi can eat these. Well, it's pretty cool to see that there's a bigger animal. There's a larva from a uh, from a beetle that can actually do that. And so it's that same one. And I don't know what the health repercussions would be if we were feeding the, those beetles polystyrene and then feeding them to the fish. But it's something to think about. And it would be killing two birds, three birds, four birds with one stone if we switched to something like that. And I think Fluval uh, bug bites have really shown that you can really get a lot from one insect in particular. You can supplement that with, you know, color enhancers and things. But one, one insect will definitely sustain a fish, if not make them uh, flourish. And it's just a matter of finding the right one for the right types of fish. But I found this really fascinating and thought, boy, we could really actually do some good by breaking down the shipping products that go with the fish industry, you know, all the insulated materials, boxes, the polystyrene, and actually then feeding that to our fish. So I thought that was a really cool twist on the story, something interesting, and I don't know the ins and outs of all of it, just found that info. But you can look through the info and the studies yourself, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that one. I really like that one myself. So uh, I'll talk to you guys later next time on Fishery. <laughs> Back to you, Jess. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Alex Williamson again here with Fishery. So we're over 60 episodes now, and I want to thank you guys for tuning in. So on Saturday, the Monterey Bay Aquarium unveiled its newest exhibit, which is called Into the Deep, a display of deep sea animals and ecosystems. And it is unlike anything else. There's usually a lot of people at that aquarium. It's a very popular aquarium, along with Atlanta's and uh, Chicago's, New York's. It's, it's one of the best in the country. Seattle has a pretty good one, too. 
uh, other than, you know, the, the great kelp forest display and the otters, the enormous open tank that spans two stories, and all the other attractions there, it's well known. Well, now they're opening a exhibit of deep sea animals, and they're going to have the cool fish like lanternfish and basically the curiosity of the deep sea is what inspired this the the deep black abysmal sea abyssal sea i always say abysmal abyssal sea which is 600 feet plus where light does not go all the way down to 6000 feet is the biggest surface or or area for animals to exist on our entire planet and deep in the ocean there is more surface uh, that has been charted on Mars than there has been of our own deep water ecosystems. And so this, this cool exhibit is going, to spe is going to feature 50 species with more than 200 different animals uh, rotating throughout the next two years. And the exhibit is going to be made possible by a series of unique opportunities that the aquarium has because it's right there on the edge of the Monterey Canyon, which is a deep sea canyon, uh, deeper than the Grand Canyon, where a lot of these species come from. So they're actually gonna go out in subs and catch new species and place them in the uh, aquarium, as well as in the, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and study these animals, some of them for the first time. And each of them are gonna be 3D modeled and scanned with lasers, and 3D printed again, and so you'll be able to walk into the lower level, see the 3D versions of these fish, see any film footage they have of them, and then you'll be able to go see a mid-water gallery where the last sunlight rays reach and see some of the animals that are in that transitional zone, and this is where um, sea mounts or underwater sea mountains are found, and they're going to have a an exhibit that shows what happens when a whale dies and when it falls down to the bottom of the sea and all the life that comes. If you've seen Planet Earth or Blue Planet, they showed this same scene and it's incredible the amount of life that comes to a large uh, body falling to the bottom of the sea floor. All those calories are so rare down there when it gets really, really deep uh, that it's pretty crazy uh, how animals take advantage of that. And when talking about keeping these animals, it's been an extreme challenge. And that's why only Japan has been the, other, the only other place or aquarium in the world to keep these, this deep of creatures in a tank for public viewing. And usually they're just kept as specimens in, you know, formaldehyde or alcohol. The, the, the problems with keeping them in a live aquarium is that it's cold and the water pressure, the pH, the dissolved oxygen, all of that is extremely extreme, if that, if that isn't too redundant. But by paying really close attention to those conditions and keeping animals in pressurized tanks and basically allowing them to avoid the bends from coming up too quickly, they're able to put them into these tanks. And some of them look like translucent strands of jewel beads and some of them look like uh, normal fish some of them look like lantern fish which you guys have probably seen and we're going to look at a couple of them in just a second here uh, but they don't just talk about fish here they talk about uh, the isopods and gastropods and other creatures that live down there crustaceans and uh, jellyfish and other things like that and these animals have as i said most of them have never been seen uh, on view in the public and never alive either for that matter. And uh, the, the curator of the uh, place is Beth Redmond Jones and she is the uh, aquarium's vice president as well. And apparently she said there's going to be a 180 degree surround theater uh, piece as never seen before with uh, kind of an IMAX of bioluminescent jellyfish as well as uh, like dives uh, footage into the deep sea diversity that's down there. 
There's also going to be a little bit of info on how humans have impacted these deep, deep water zones and how uh, basically plastics and garbage have gotten down there into that ecosystem and what the repercussions are. And there's even going to be like a video game for kids there. And there's going to be a bunch of uh, different interactive stations for kids too. So if you're ever in the Monterey Bay area near San Francisco, kind of, um, definitely check that out. That's going to be awesome. So let's look at some of the fish from that really quick before we finish up here. And uh, then we'll move right on. So let's go look at those fishies. All right, guys, so I wanted to show you this, which is the Monterey Bay Aquarium dot org and uh, slash visit slash exhibits slash into dash the dash deep. And you you can find it by Googling it, but they have a whole online uh, access to the entire showcase there, which is really cool and might be fun, especially for kids or even teenagers. Uh, but students definitely, uh, and all of us fish nerds alike. But they've got it broken down into basically down uh, to the deep, and they've got fish there, and they've got videos on it and information on it on the website. And then they've got the midwater uh, section. Then they have the sea floor, which has a lot more of the uh, little crustaceans and isopods and t things like that. And then they've got the abyssal zone which is the super deep canyons uh and what they have uh on the exhibit all the time uh what they're going to be showing or at least trying to have are um the pacific hagfish mushroom corals pom-pom anemones uh these interesting um tunicates and then they've got the blood belly comb jelly which is uh naturally um bioluminescent bone eating worms red sea fan giant isopod the lump fish uh the sea angel um uh, bubblegum coral feather star the lobed comb jelly which again these are like the lights that move down the edge of them they look really incredible uh and then they've got the snow globe jelly they've got all sorts of really cool stuff the red paper lantern jelly it looks like a ruby and then they've got fish, you know, Jap the Japanese armor head, um, glowing sea cucumber, fire sea star, Japanese porcupine crab, the elephant fish of the sea, not a mormorid. And then, you know, they've got sable fish, um, the salmon snail fish. There's a whole bunch of like salmon beach and salmon snail and salmon this fish that aren't actually salmon. Uh, but again, then they've got the basket star and this is the stuff that they have there all the time. And then they're going to have webcams and all sorts of other stuff. So I highly, uh, encourage you guys to either visit or at least check it out online. Pretty cool stuff. Thanks for watching guys. Talk to you later. Hey guys, it's Alex Williamson here again with the secret history living in your aquarium. And today we're talking fishery on the aquatic morning show. So what we're going to talk about today is ultra black marine animals. I know last episode we talked about some of the Monterey Bay's uh, exhibit specimens that are going to be there and some of the crazy things that live down below the, the zone where there's light. And last week we talked about how the Congo River actually has regions that are that deep. So we might be finding all sorts of new fish in freshwater regions around the world. Uh, Lake Baikal is another one that gets that deep. There, there's a number of places that get that deep and that have some biodiversity. There's other spots that get that deep like Crater Lake that are freshwater, but they don't have a whole lot of diversity uh, when it comes to fish. It's It's been pretty isolated. So for the first time, these ultra black fish that exist down in the bottom of the ocean and uh, upwards to the middle of the ocean as well, I guess, uh, they have been documented and there are 16 varieties of these deep sea fish that we've found and uh, a woman named Karen Osborne, who's an ichthyologist and um, she works at the Smithsonian Institute, she says that fish have essentially three options to survive in the deep sea. That's either they can find a very few places to hide if they're on the very bottom, they can be really fast, they can be really uh, big, and that takes a lot of energy, uh, and uh, they can be invisible. 
those are kind of their options. And the better strategy for escaping predators moving through the water undetected uh, by any sort of pr for any sort of prey is now being studied and published in uh, a journal called Current Biology. And researchers have discovered an evolutionary tactic that gives some fish an invisibility cloak. Uh, for the first time, they're seeing these fish that are ultra black, and they are cover covered in these little skin pigmentations uh, that that are a cluster of cells that are very, very uh, dark and uniquely uh, organized. And they only reflect 0.5% of the visible light spectrum back from the surface, which is crazy. I mean, it, most fish are somewhere more in the 80% to 50% range. Uh, and even like a black ghost knife fish is up in the 20 to 30% range reflecting light because we see it as black. We see little subtleties and contours. This is a fish that if it's up against something black and you shine a light on it, you barely see it still. They had to do some really special photography, which we'll look at, to show these wicked looking fish. They're really uh, kind of crazy looking fish. So hold tight, we'll take a look at them too. But they're studying the uh, efficient survival tactic that is ultra black camouflage and uh, now they're also developing new synthetic camouflage materials out of this like uh, I don't know if any artists out there have heard of Vanta Black but Vanta Black was a paint that came out a few years ago that was so dark the human eye looks at it and it looks like there's a hole there it looks like nothing's there you can use it on a wall and it looks like a hole of black light like light doesn't even escape it in a reflection like it doesn't look like a paint. It looks like a hole. And uh, another guy came out with a pigment because this fine artist uh, came up with that pigment. And he used some of the science that was dug up recently in the last five years about these ultra black fish in order to get a pigment that was so dark that it rivaled the Vanta black. And it's considered uh, the darkest pigment you can buy. And uh, I'll link to that just because it's really cool. If you wanted to paint something with it, uh, it would be ultra black. Like the back of your aquariums, it would make for killer photography. Uh, and I'm definitely going to try to get a hold of some. Uh, it's in and out of stock a lot because it's kind of a popular deal. But the funny deal is that the first guy made the stuff and he copyrighted it and said that nobody else could buy it. And he used it for sculptures and other stuff that looked like, you know, he'd paint a sculpture of a human or a mannequin and it just looked like a black hole, like plays tricks on your eyes. It's very odd. And apparently camera, you know, camera and video footage don't do it justice, but uh, you can go there in, in person and people are like touching it to like double check that it's really there, that it's not just like a hole in space. So it's a really odd occurrence. Now those pigments that are synthetic are getting all the way down to like 0.001% or 0.005% in the case of the other one. And because the one guy patented it and wouldn't allow other artists to use it, this other guy came out and he does other pigments that are bright pink and fluorescent colors, white, bright white colors. Uh, he sells them and you just have to click that you're not that other artist if you're going to buy it. <laughs> like certifying you're not the guy who invented Vanta Black and wouldn't share it with the world, which I think is funny. So back to the fish. So the implications of understanding this fish also could really help us with treating skin cancer. 99% of the habitable space on the planet is in the ocean, as I was saying. And we've only begun to understand the diversity of animals that are in the sea and that call it home down in these deep water zones. So the ones that have uh, adapted to these deep water, mid-ocean zones, they don't have a bottom at all to go to. And so they need to survive floating mid-water. And that's why they think they've evolved this black strategy and not bioluminescence. Other fish want to be seen or they want to give off light so they can see it. Kind of like an infrared camera has a little light source. So if you have no place to rest, no place to hide, and you have very little food available in this region anyways, it makes sense to be super dark black and be able to sneak up on things and eat them. Uh, and one of the authors of this most recent study, 
and her name, I believe, was uh, Karen Osborne. Yeah, it's the same lady who's in charge of the museum. So these are all weird things that are quite different than most of the other uh, habitats that we ever think about. Even the deep sea floor and subsequently most of the animals that live out there look really, really weird as is. Now imagine a zone where there is no floor, there is no shape or form, and that is most of the ocean. So enter the ultra black fishes. Now there are 16 species that can move very stealthily without creating much turbulence movement or any sound obviously uh, that's audible to humans anyhow and they've been studying these fish uh, for a while they found them at the surface once in a blue moon and then decided to try to hunt them down and some crustaceans for example are transparent but if light shines on them it shows up really really quickly and a lot of creatures have the bioluminescence however these don't reflect any of that bioluminescent light hardly and don't reflect anything but that 0.05% of the natural UV light if it makes it to their zone. So uh, the first fish we're going to look at and uh, see some pictures of here is going to be the fang tooth and I don't think they have a Latin name for it yet but it's pretty interesting uh, what this fish has evolved to look like and they were able to capture it with some really, really expensive camera lenses that were able to see uh, that light when 99.5% of any light shined on it was just absorbed. So there's a few other animals that are also like this, birds of paradise and some butterflies, some beetles, and one or two snakes also carry these uh, arrangements of dark pigments. And it's actually melanin in most species, but they think that there may be something else in there that's causing a whole new way of having pigmentation. Uh, and it really makes all colors pop really bright against it. So that makes sense in the animals on land, but down in the bottom of the sea, they don't have any contrasting colors to draw attention to themselves. So I just thought this was a really cool story and research is still totally ongoing about it. Uh, and it's really hard to find these things because uh, Obviously, they can disappear into the deep very quickly. And it's only been using microscopes and taking tissue samples from non-blackfish and comparing them to these uh, ultra-blackfish uh, that they've found the really unique uh, patterns. And, and basically, they're, they, they all focus light into one place. And then rather than like a reflector that shines it back out, they reflect into each other and the light is absorbed basically into the skin by by melanin and uh, and reflectors but the reflectors aren't seen they're micro and they only reflect back at the skin so it's kind of like this 3d textured skin it's pretty cool so let's take a look at that fish I know this has been another long episode but I'm glad you guys have stuck with me we'll take a look at the fish for a minute and then I'll be signing off here all right, everybody, so I promised to show you the, the, some of these fish. Uh, this one uh, is a photo from the Smithsonian. It's got some white on the gills and some of its eye that reflect, but everything else is ultra black pigment. And if you scroll through, there's a Smithsonian article. Oh, man, ads always pop up. But if you scroll through, look at this. It's biting its own tail. Uh, it's interesting. It probably caught a glimpse of it with the camera lighting and then <laughs> bit it. Uh, but they have a, a whole different list of these ultra black fish in there. And uh, like I was saying, they made that ultra black paint from looking at the pigment of these fish. And they've even got some videos on, and other information on it. But I just had to show you guys uh, this one, the, the fanged fish, and then that first one, which is just wicked. I mean, there's its face. And... Uh, th Again, there are 16 of these species, and there's its whole body, and it's biting its tail. So, pretty crazy uh, creatures, but I wanted to share that with you. Sorry, these are kind of longer episodes this week, but uh, lots of cool stuff in the news and about uh, about the, uh, the fishy world. So, all right, guys, I'll talk to you later. Again, that's the Smithsonian website that has uh, this stuff on it right now.
Bye bye. Hey everybody, it's Alex Williamson again here with Fishery, and uh, today I wanted to talk about a new product that's on the market. There's been iterations of this product, and there's been a pond version, and now there's a home version and a reef version. And the the way the product is spelled is S E N E Y E, so it looks like Sen I. I'm assuming it's seeing I, like C N I. Uh, kind of trying to be a play on words of see and then seeing and I like it, it monitors things anyways it's it's a silly name but let's move on past that so the CNI uh, is a new monitor that's that's being sold I've never been contacted by the company don't know anything about them other than the reviews I've been reading online but they've been something that's available in the saltwater uh, fish hobby for years now, uh, which is uh, little sensors that then feed to a computer or to a monitor. And this is one in particular can feed to your computer and then to an app on your uh, either tablet, laptop, uh, or phone. And if you have like a tablet or something in your uh, fish room that has whatever the, you know, the status quo for running this system is, it will actually test uh, your lumens, your Kelvin, like the light. It will test the how warm, it, you know, the, the warmness of it uh, in Kelvins. It will test how strong it is in lumens. And it will test PAR also, depending on how deep you're putting the monitor, you can then get different readings. Now, some people online said that the PAR was like five to six points off. But to me, I mean, that is when, when your average tank, you're talking about like 45 to 200 par or whatever, you know, I didn't think that was that huge of a deal. Um, and that's comparing it to, to $2,000 equipment. Now, this kit starts at around $230. And then from there, you can monitor it in the fish room on a computer or, or a tablet. But if you want to monitor Wi-Fi and relay it to like your phone or to another uh, computer, then you have to buy a, a server thing that's another like 240 bucks or something. Uh, and I'll link to these products with uh, the Amazon affiliate link. It's the cheapest I saw these products. And uh, all full disclosure, I, w I will get a 0.05% cut of the profits if uh, if you decide to go buy it but I'm not at all endorsing this product I'm just uh, bringing it up for those of you who would like something to monitor your uh, your tanks and it also monitors temperature ammonia water level and when it's time to do a water change I mean you can set that function to do a lot of things and then all of this is graphed through software and the only downside with the ammonia was it was saying that you have to buy these little uh, inserts that are basically like a filter tray and you, you buy one every 30 days or the software is very, very off slash in some models, people were saying in some countries that it actually uh, tells you like need new, new disc, uh, must like buy new disc. And they're, they're somewhere around 10 to $30 depending on the country. But what I would say is that most people don't need to monitor the ammonia. Most people would probably be looking for one, uh, a temperature notification if the tank or the heater starts going really hot or starts getting really cold. And the other thing that you might want to know is if the water was leaking. And now like Inkbird and a few other um, different products that are out there already make sensors that can sense moisture that you can put on the ground uh, right on your floorboards uh, that will also do that but um, I would say that you know this is just kind of interesting because it's trying to be the high-tech all-in-one system that incorporates all of this and uh, like I said I'll put some links to it uh, in the the video on my community tab for the members um, and it's an interesting idea. The, the results that were getting reviewed by well-informed um, well folks uh, did point out that there's a reef version of the CNI and there is a home and pond version. Now, the only thing that's different is that uh, the, the reef version has this light meter on it and it's a hundred bucks more it, i think the home and pond version 
are right around uh, $161 without the Wi-Fi relay. And with those, it kind of makes it sound like you'd want the Wi-Fi relay uh, built in. And then uh, you also have the issue of how you want to secure it and stuff like that. They sell other accessories that can add up pretty quickly if you wanted to buy the whole kit and caboodle of all their offerings. But um, I thought this was interesting because it was really the first product that I've seen that had kind of all in one. And even though the name doesn't make sense, if you had a freshwater tank, you could buy the Reef CNI, which is S E N E Y E. Uh, and that would then give you the PAR, the LUX, and the Kelvin light monitoring, and if it's on or off, the water level, the ammonia, and temperature. And so all that info is pretty helpful, really, um, if you're worried about fish, especially if you're on vacation or something and you want to check in on them. Uh, so don't buy the home version or the pond version, apparently, because they just don't come with the light thing. You have to buy it as an extra on top of everything else, uh, is what most of the reviews seem to say. But regardless of all that, I'd like to know if any of you guys have it, if you've tried it, what you think of it. Um, I'd be really interested because it's pretty cool technology. I know API is coming out with some similar stuff. And Apogee is who usually does all the like par lumens um, kind of testing stuff for lights that's high end, um, you know, calibrated, all that kind of stuff. And the cheapest units start at $529 or so and go all the way up to $2,000, $3,000. So this is substantially less at somewhere between 250 if you just want a tablet in your fish room in one tank versus sounds like it's around 500 to 600 if you want multiple leads and monitors and um, wireless server uh, to relay it to your phone and computer. But I'd love to hear if anybody knows more about it, uh, if they love it, if they hate it, if it sucks, if it's great, whatever, uh, because the reviews I read actually seem kind of promising, especially if this is Gen 1. Uh, maybe give it another year. Prices might come down a little, and they might even have more functionality and more accuracy. So I'm really curious to see how this unfolds. But uh, thanks for joining us this morning, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Back to you guys at the Aquatic Morning Show. Bye.